my grandmother passed in December. And so we just cleared out her uh, storage unit and all of the things came to my house and stuff. So we just started looking through photo albums that she had. But so as we were looking, I happened to flip through them and I started looking, I was like, wow, I wonder what this is. And it was actually newspaper clippings from the year 1990, it was April 1990. And one of the headings is, um, one of the headings was unarmed black man killed by three police officers. And it was just so crazy to me. I had to read it like two or three times because I'm like, wait a minute. This happened in April of 1990. We're in the year 2020 and we just witnessed the same exact thing with George Floyd. We just witnessed a similar thing with Breonna Taylor. All these different people that have been killed by police and people still have the audacity to say racism doesn't exist anymore. Oh, I don't have white privilege. You know what I mean? And it's just, it, that was another one of the things that really like outraged me and wanted, like fueled me to go protest even more because it's like, I'm physically looking at this piece of history in my hands, reading what's going on and reading how this man was killed and murdered in the, at the hands of the police. And then I'm in present day reading about and seeing what happened to George Floyd. It, it's literally just like history just took itself and copied over into a new sheet of paper, into a new chapter. I considered the march to be my self-care walk because literally me being there was self-care. Um, just fighting for my right to be a human being. Like I've had a lot of um, paranoia and anxiety around my life and mortality as a black queer person. And so me being there was like, you know what, I'm not gonna accept this. I'm not gonna accept that I might live only to 35 years old. I'm not gonna accept that um, my black and brown brothers are being gunned down by white citizens and police officers. Um, I'm not gonna take it. I brought the flag because I wanted people to see that Queer people are out here. Queer black people matter, and we are at the forefront of the movement. That has been true since day one. When the murder of George Floyd had occurred, um, it impacted me in a way that I didn't expect. I, I just cried. And I, I do have two young boys, they're ages 11 and four, and I remember going into my bathroom almost hiding so that they wouldn't hear me crying. And as the days transpired and all the news and the protests began, I was just like so moved by it. I was very hesitant to participate in a protest because of the pandemic, but I knew that this was the perfect time for us to actually speak out. It was a tough one when you were a kid. There was a distinct feeling that you got that to, to, to prove yourself, whether it's friends' parents, whether it's going to the friends' homes, there's things you just, I, you can't, you know, always authentically respond. I felt like I was on presentation a lot. I went through a lot, man, trying to get, like, to myself to a place to understand where my anxiety was coming from. And a lot of this was racially driven, and I just never really acknowledged wouldn't go there. I had to put a lot of things down. And I had issues dealing with anxiety, heavy anxiety issues, heavy mental health depression issues, that stuff was, fun, it was fundamental, fundamental to building where my energy is coming from in this, and I have to acknowledge it. The moments leading up to it would have been like, just being a black body myself and having black like brothers, I have two brothers, so I have a twin too, my own age. Most of the young guys who have been killed by police brutality have been older than 17, and my brother's 25, so. I have to keep worrying about them, worrying about myself, worrying about my sister, she drives. Sandra Bland was a routine traffic stop. That could be her, you know? So I think the moments leading up to it have just been living, you know? When I really like sat down and like decided, yeah, this is what I'm gonna fight for was, of course there was a lot of factors, but what really led up to it was just like, just being downtown. Because growing up in New Haven, Yale is right here in downtown New Haven. And Yale is its own separate city. 
and where a lot of rich kids come here and they get their education and then they leave. Or they come back as sociologists and then they come and study black kids for statistics. Being here is just, it makes you feel um, you're always surveillance because there's always cops here and if someone here is um, on the green because they're homeless or on the green because they're on drugs and need help, they're don't, not there to de-escalate, they're there to arrest you because it's criminalized. There's so many cases where police um, get called in to handle something that more like a medical person or a therapist should be handling and they don't know how to de-escalate um, or like calm somebody going through a panic attack, somebody going through anxiety or, or having an episode. Instead, they pull out that gun and they, it's a permanent solution to a problem that just needs time and care and energy and community. I mean, I had a gun pulled on me by a cop when I went to school in front of our college bar. I'm getting into a car with, <laughs> getting in a car with my um, uh, girlfriend at the time of my friend and the cops coming up, lights on, screaming at me out the window, back the F, fuck, fuck, I mean, I don't know, if I, back the F away, f fuck away from the car. Back the fuck away from the car, get the fuck away from them. It, that was like right around Trayvon, like, I don't know what, it's right around that time I'm thinking college and I was like, I just immediately, I instinct, I put my hands up and I, I approached the car, like, I walked to the car and I was like, sir, these are my friends. I was just going back to the, our girlfriend. I'm just explaining in a calm tone. And he said, don't you ever fucking put, come up to a cop car like that in your life. Don't you ever set foot like that in your life. Get the fuck on the sidewalk. Made me get on the sidewalk, had the gun up. He's getting out of the car then. I'm sitting on the sidewalk, he's approaching. And then he goes to my friends and he says, are you guys friends with them? And they're like, yeah, we're just going, going home from the bar. And then he says to me, you know, don't you ever approach an officer like that again in your life. And you're not going in with them, you're walking. At some point, I have to bring kids into this world. And even if I don't bring kids into this world, you know what I mean? I have to still live in this world. And I don't want to continue to live in a world where I have to walk into a store and immediately take my hoodie off because I don't want them to think that I'm Trayvon Martin. You know what I mean? I don't want them to think that me going to get a, a Arizona and some Skittles is violent. Initially when people meet me, they, they just see my skin, they see my hair, and they have assumptions of me. They don't know that I'm an educated black woman, that I have, or I'm pursuing a master's degree, and that I'm raising black boys. And my sadness for them was, will they be given the right opportunity in life, or will they always still be you know, a black child? My boys, they play with children of all kinds. And I live in a predominantly white town. I don't ever want to be fearful that my son is going to go out one day and he may not come home. That is a very hard thing for me to comprehend, especially when um, I'm doing everything that I can to give them the life that they deserve. But I can't control the world around us. Even if they took away all the white people or all the racist people out of the country, the systems will still be there. The systems that work for white people will still be there. We still wouldn't be have the opportunity to get ahead. You can walk around this earth and you can pretend like none of this is happening, but it's happening, whether we like it or not. It's been happening and it's gonna continue to happen if people continue to ignore it. I encourage my white counterparts to please do your education and to learn because all our lives, all we had to do was learn about white history. <laughs> there are so many parts in our social studies classes and our history classes that leave out amazing information. Why should we have to wait till February, the shortest month in the calendar, to know about black history? And half of that stuff is just, it's sugar-coated. It's not the real thing, you know? Google is a thing. There are, even if you don't trust Google, there's libraries, there's books, like real books, <laughs> that'll actually teach you the history that you want to know so that you can educate yourself without us having to tell you, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people won't say it, but I'll be the one to. To have a white person kind of ask you, well, what really are you fighting for? To have a white person really say, you know, well, what all did you guys really go through? It's kind of insensitive, not kind of, it's very insensitive. 
And then it's just like almost unimaginable to think, wow, you really don't get it or you really just don't know. Even in the media, they were showing the riots, but they weren't showing the dancing. They weren't showing the drumming. They weren't showing the singing. This might happen again in a couple years because people are still being ignorant and they're still not trying to educate and they're still not trying to learn. If me at 17 years old can wrap my head around this concept, then old folks should be able to, you know, wrap their head around it. It's bizarre to me, that's why I'm laughing because if I could really understand it, it shouldn't, it's not rocket science, you know? If we don't get comfortable with being uncomfortable, we're still gonna be in the same space. If we get in a place where people acknowledge color and don't have a problem with it, and I can see your history, if we get in that place, see what your history and see what that means to you and, and acknowledge your humanity, that's what we want. We don't want people to not to see color, we want people to acknowledge our humanity and to, to move based on that.